Uh, we're really delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Randy Sprick. I'm part of a team that we call Safe and Civil Schools. I want to offer greetings from both Safe and Civil Schools, uh, which is kind of the consulting, professional development, technical support arm of things, uh, along with Pacific Northwest Publishing that publishes the Safe and Civil Schools materials, along with supporting resources like uh, Anita Archer's Explicit Instruction, uh, Dr. Bill Jensen's wonderful Tough Kid materials, Hill Walker's materials, of systematic screening and so on. Uh, this team from Safe and Civil Schools and Pacific Northwest Publishing uh, has been putting on this conference for, uh, this is our 21st year, um, and uh, the goal of this conference is to empower you with additional academic and behavioral strategies. Not theory, not philosophy, it's grounded in theory, it's grounded in philosophy, but what's critical for you as school and district-based practitioners is strategies. What do we do on a daily basis? And so that's the focus. So in getting ready for this, I always, I always uh, am somewhat struck with the challenge of there are some of you here who have heard me so many times, you could be given this speech instead of me, uh, but others are more new to this, and so to try to strike a theme that uh, bridges that gap just a little bit, I thought let's focus on best practice. So the theme is, the title is Practicing Best Practice. Now in Merriam-Webster Dictionary, best practice is defined like this, a procedure that has been shown by research and experience to produce optimal results and that is established or proposed as a standard suitable for widespread adoption shown by research and experience, best practice. That's what we need to be about. So let me frame some parts of what you're going to be working with here over the course of the next four days. All of this fits within an MTSS, multi-tier system of support framework. Multi-tier system of support is in fact best practice because it is about creating a continuum in our school where no child falls through gaps in our system. But right now nationally with graduation rates about 81%, which is higher than they have ever been in the United States of America for which we should take great pride but that still means almost one out of five kids is falling through the cracks. That's not cracks, that's vast gaping chasms. The challenges are daunting. Here is part of why those challenges are daunting and why we need to think about systems where no kids fall through the cracks. As short a time ago as 1900, from world history, 1900 is not all that long ago. 1900, only 6% of the American population graduated from high school. They didn't need multi-tier systems of support because school was for the elite and there were plenty of jobs on the farm and the factory for people who didn't choose to complete school. Those days are gone. We are asking teachers now to try to teach every single child and that is an incredibly, incredibly daunting task. Positive behavior support in a good multi-tier system of support framework is part of what we'll be talking to you about. Some of you are in sessions with either Marilyn Sprick uh, or Anita Archer, which is working on instructional strategies to work on the academic side of multi-tier system of support. But let me share with you my, perhaps it will sound facetious or sarcastic, it is not. My definition of multi-tier system of support as best practice is simply this. Always try the easiest, cheapest thing first and hope you get lucky. <laughs> or put in another way, we can't call a neurosurgeon for everybody who has a headache. We can't have a behavior specialist, an occupational therapist, a special education teacher for every kid who exhibits a struggle. We don't have the resources to do that. So we always have to try the easiest, cheapest things first, both on the behavioral side and the academic side and a visual for doing this. Our characterization of multi-tier system of support is perhaps slightly different than what you've seen in other characterizations. Other characterizations tend to have a triangle where they go universal, target, and intensive, and they have the figures 80%, 15%, uh, et cetera, but I think from that visual it looks like one-third of our work is universal, one-third of our work is tier two, and one-third of our work is tier three. I don't think it can work that way. 
I think especially for general education teachers, if I've done my geometry correctly, in this visual, the combined classroom and school-wide tier one has nine times more surface area than the combined tiers two and tiers three. Now there are players in the room whose entire professional role is creating these support systems. I understand that, I applaud that, I, I, I worship that. But for gen ed teachers, there ought to be nine times more ta time, effort, and professional development energy into analyzing what are we doing well, let's protect it, where are the gaps in our system, and what can we do with all kids to reduce the number of kids who need tier two or tier three supports. I am not knocking check in, check out, but I run into, uh, there's research to support it. I'm not knocking at all, I'm wildly supportive of it. I am saying, we run into schools though where teachers say, I have 30 kids a class, I have five classes a day, I have four minutes between classes, and at the end of every class, I'm supposed to fill out seven or eight check sheets on kids. You're putting way too much effort on, into a tier two support that's a valuable tier two support, but if you have that many kids needing tier two support, you need to be putting more energy into tier one to reduce the number of kids who need those tier two supports. Um, within this characterization, if the foundation of school-wide practices has cracks or gaps or weaknesses, you can be the best classroom teacher in the world, but that classroom teacher will not stay very long in that building because they cannot face a, a working within a context where there's no consistency, where there's no um, uh, collegiality, etc. You will even lose those best teachers. And likewise, if you have great school-wide structures, we have wonderfully well-orchestrated positive common areas, but we have a third of our staff who are weak in classroom management. You are going to have so many kids who appear to need tier two and tier three supports. So although we're gonna be working at all of these levels, we put a huge emphasis on tier one. Because if, heaven forbid, we have weaknesses both at the classroom level and at the school-wide level, we are trying to build tier two supports on a framework that is crumbling. If you have a kid who has severe anger management problems and he's in a school with well-organized, highly structured, but very supportive classrooms, environments where kids have been taught the expectations for hallway behavior, and there's lots of socialization in the hall, but it's at a moderate voice level and so on. That kid can apply the anger management strategies that you are teaching him in some kind of tier two context. You put that very same kid in a school where the halls are loud, chaotic, kids are rude, there's not enough adults present. I don't care how well your tier two anger management stuff is going, that child's gonna deck somebody. We have to create good, solid frameworks, and we have to be building all of this all together. It's not like you wait to build tier two and tier three until tier one is solid, but we have to keep working on all of these levels concurrently so we create a level of support that most kids can stand upon without needing individualized supports. But those kids who do need the individualized supports, they desperately need well-orchestrated environments at the tier one level. Now, I'm gonna hone in on the behavior side of it now because that's my area and Anita and Marilyn uh, will be working more on the academic side. But positive behavior support. Positive behavior support really is just an outgrowth of the science of behaviorism which has been around since the early 1900s. It never caught on. Skinner brought it into the era of behavior modification. It never caught on. Oh, all those lab rats, all those blah, blah, blah. Um, called a behavior analysis that never caught on. Here's the good news, folks. Behavior support is now catching on, and all it is is behavior modification in different words. Now, I am not knocking it, I love it. In fact, my introduction to behavior modification was this. I needed a job at the age of 19 to be putting myself through Portland State University just a few blocks from here. I found out there was a job opening in a program for severely emotionally disturbed kids. It was housed in an elementary school. It served 50 elementary schools. They took the toughest kids from 50 different elementary schools. I found out they had an opening for an aide. 
Going into education was the furthest thing from my mind. I went for the interview. They said, you're male. If you want the job, you've got the job. I said, great, <laughs> because it's entirely female staff, mainly boys, uh, as clients. Um, I said, I'll take the job. They said, great, uh, you can start tomorrow. But also, one of the classes is actually going over to the high school for swimming lessons this week. Would you like to go with them? I went with them. I was sitting with what, the other aide, a woman named Pat Paul, who had been uh, an assistant there for four years already. Riding back on that bus, Pat Paul said, I said to Pat Paul, so what's the, what's the approach here? Is it like psychoanalytic or something? She said, no, it's a systematic behavior modification approach. I actually skipped most of high school psychology. I did not know what that was. I merely smiled and nodded. I actually did learn years later that if you smile and nod, people mistake it for wisdom. Um, <laughs> and it served me very, very well. Um, but I then started working with this team of brilliant educators. I joined it in 1971. It started in 1968. Systematic explicit instruction is their curriculum systematic behavior analytic approach to looking at behavior and using data on both the academic side. We had academic and behavioral charts on every single kid every single day to track progress across time. That was 1971 and do you know that all that has happened in the intervening 46 years? More and more research has said that's what we need to be doing. It's what we need to be doing. We in Safe and Civil actually overlay the stoic framework, which many of you are familiar with. If you're in chants, foundations, interventions, you'll, and you're not familiar with it, you will be familiar with it by the end of the week. It basically is a framework that says, let's structure for success, teach expectations, let's observe student behavior, supervise and monitor. While we're observing, let's interact positively with kids, and when we have to correct, let's do it fluently. This next slide. If you do not know behavioral psychology, ABC, you have my permission to take a two minute nap. You truly do not need to understand this next stuff that I'm going to say. But if you do know ABC, antecedent behavior consequence, behavior modification is based on this. The antecedents that happen before a behavior will prompt certain behavior, which then what happens after the behavior the individual learns, was that a good thing to do in the presence of those antecedents or not? It is not a philosophy. It's just a description of how people learn. I think here is part of why it's never caught on. It's all about how people learn. It's not about how people teach. Stoic is an overlay about how people teach. S and T are the ultimate antecedents. Every basketball coach, every practice that a basketball coach has is a very complex set of antecedents to get kids to exhibit, to get the team, whether they're kids or adults, to exhibit the behaviors in the pressure of the game. Every practice before a game is a complex mix of both structural elements, plays, patterns, organizational strategies, and teaching the team to operate from those. While the game's going on, the coach is observing, and both during and after, the coach hopefully is interacting positively and correcting fluently. That's the framework. It is an overlay that is how do we teach kids the behaviors that they need in order to be successful. Some of you are in districts where stoic has become common language of the district. There are districts, some of them represented here, who have a poster like this in the staff room and in any kind of problem solving room where teams meet because whenever we want to change the behavior of anybody, we should look at what are a range of variables that we can manipulate to try to accomplish that. In fact, one example of this becoming common language, uh, my dear friend and colleague Susan Isaacs uh, has been working with the district Conroe ISD in Texas, 60,000 kids in the district. They now, some number of years later, I don't know, six, seven, eight years that Conroe's been working on, they have a whole student support department who support schools. Each of these people that you're going to see a picture of in just a moment have four, five, seven schools that they support. I was doing a workshop in Dallas. The Conroe student support team came to that. They all wore these shirts. What the shirt says, for those of you in the back, by the way, is you had me at Stoic. 
uh, I said, can we get a picture? I did not realize I was going to look like a giggling five-year-old girl <laughs> in the picture, which really had me debate, did I want to share this with you or not? But I've got courage. I can do it. Um, it is part of the common language that they are trying to get established, and they've just uh, achieved some awesome results within Conroe. Uh, one of the colleagues that I get to work with, Andrea Hanford from Florida, uh, sent me this. Uh, just wanted to share that lately I've been doing a piece within trainings called The Power of Stoic. I tell participants that Stoic is powerful and that no matter where you fit in the educational system, you should be implementing Stoic practices. If you're the superintendent, how are we structuring the district? How are we teaching our principals? How are we correcting principals if they're not meeting expectations in ways that a superintendent should be correcting a principal in exactly the way that we would want a teacher to correct a child, which is everybody's dignity is maintained, but information is provided for doing better in the future. Principals. Here's an example. Principals, have you created norms for staff meetings? I have at various points had principals say, Randy, it drives me crazy when teachers bring papers to grade during staff meetings. And in a couple of cases I've gone, have you told your staff at the beginning of the year you don't want them to grade papers? No? We'll start there, okay? Anything that annoys us as somebody who is in a superordinate position, we should look at what can we do to teach people who are with us under our charge to do it well. Uh, Andrea is using that language to do it. So just some examples here, and you'll be getting a lot of examples as the week goes on, but some examples of structure, physical arrangements, scheduling patterns, routines and procedures, expectations for student behavior, expectations for staff behavior. Uh, here's a quick example from my friend and colleague, Laura Hamilton, uh, who's been doing some work, and uh, Teresa Farmer and others from uh, Alabama, the State Department of Alabama are here. We are very privileged to get to work with you. Here's just a quick little video from one of the schools about some structural elements that they did, and it actually begins with some posters of kids uh, which were responses from surveys after they made these changes. In the beginning, I think the main problem was the fact that the students were allowed to sit anywhere in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So we changed that by getting rid of the, uh, the cafe style seating, mm -hmm. the circular tables, mm -hmm. and we implemented the long rectangular uh, tables. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of letting kids sit where, where they want to, they have to go to the first available seat. Mm -hmm. Also, when they first got off of the bus uh, last year, last year they could get off the bus, they could wait and then they could come down to breakfast. Well now, as soon as they get into the building, they put their bags up, then they come down to the cafeteria. So it sort of sped up the process. Uh, we also were able to have two lines now. You know, last year we only had one line, uh, so because we only had one keypad. And so now we have two keypads, and so we have seventh and eighth grade on one side, and we have fifth and sixth grade on the other side. And so I think that helps a lot. Um, we don't have a problem with uh, friends or relatives sitting with each other. You know, you may have, for, for an example, you may have a fifth grader whose brother's in the seventh grade, and they would all sort of sit together with people from the neighborhood on the same bus. But now since we have fifth and sixth on one side and seventh and eighth on the other side, it sort of cut that out. And it's sort of sped, just sped up the time. Well, of course, with change, uh, when you're trying to change anything, whether it's adults or whether it's students, you always have that resistance to begin with. But I think it's sort of, it's coming on. I think uh, some students know why we're doing it, especially the ones that took the survey and said, hey, the cafeteria is a problem, or even, you know, break is a problem. Because, yeah, they hate sitting on the curb, but I think they feel safer. You know, the students feel safer, and even the ones that just still don't understand why we do it, 
I think it's sort of growing on them. You know? I think the changes were good. Okay. Um, you can tell um, as they're walking in, you okay. know, they know what to do. Right. Um, they know how to line up, and okay. uh, it's working very well. Um, it seems to, since we have changed the seating arrangements and the way the children are to come through the line, that it has um, helped a lot. They seem to um, get through at a faster pace and seem to um, get finished quicker too, mm -hmm. as far as them getting hit from point A to point B. So to me, it seems to be a positive change, changing the seating area, how they come in and how they line up and everything. So I think it's been a good change. Okay. Breakfast area, this, um, the line seems to move quicker with the way that we have set it up. and. Um, they seem to get in here and get out and get back to homeroom before the time is actually up. Mm -hmm. So it seems to help a lot. And some, and on some days, our breakfast participation has picked up. Right. So the voice levels seem to be better the way they have them seated than them being spread out everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's more controlled. Right. Yes, because then you have more eyes over different areas instead of everyone together they're more spread out and they can see what's more going on with the children, the students, than the poor. Now that, that example that they just shared from that school, they were having a problem at breakfast, they made some structural changes, they made a specific choice, breakfast is a problem, we're going to get rid of these round tables, they instead got the rectangular. Is that an implication that you should get rid of round tables if you have them? Not at all. Anything that is not a problem in your school, never look at a strategy that worked in another school and go, oh, we ought to do that because this other school says it's a good idea. All of this should be done because we've got a specific problem that we want to share. But I will tell you the change that they made of coming into breakfast, not giving kids free choice of seating area. Do you know what that forces kids to learn to do? To socialize with kids who are outside their social group. And whether it's done through seating patterns in the cafeteria, I do challenge all of you, and those of you in the foundation session will actually spend a little bit of time on this one. What are you doing to ensure that no kids are completely socially isolated in your school? And what are you doing to bust up some of the social groups so that kids that have such a tight protected social group have the courage to get to know other kids in the school? So it all starts feeling as inclusive as hopefully we've tried to create even here this evening. Now, the one that I put here was also one that Laura sent me, which is this is actually in a school that this is the ISS room, but somebody painted over the CL. So instead of ISS, it's now the ASS room. That is not a structural element that I recommend you copy uh, here. Um, moving on to the T of this STOIC acronym. Teaching expectations involves teaching expectations, teaching the goals, which we call guidelines for success. What is the spiritual core of your school? What do you want children to remember for the rest of their lives about the gift that they got to attend your school? It's not, oh, they worked me really hard. It's they worked me really hard and what they just pounded into me was, one example that I will be sharing in Foundations is from Interlake High School in Bellevue, Washington, to the north of here, Integrity Humanity Scholarship. And the staff so grabbed a hold of those three words that it literally became the spirit of that school. But it's also teaching rules, it's teaching procedures that will help students learn academic skills and will help them learn behavioral skills. Now, if you haven't reflected on this, 
this next statement is in no way a criticism of your school or your classroom because it is inescapable. Your classroom and your school is an extremely complex mix of rituals, procedures, rules, and expectations. And those of you who know CHAMPS, know CHAMPS honors the idiosyncrasies. There's never going to be a school-wide pencil sharpener policy. That would just be stupid. You would just annoy your teachers. But the fact that kids go from classroom to classroom, any high school kid who has six different teachers has at least three fundamentally different pencil sharpener policies that they experience during the day. Now this notion of teaching expectations, it is not just teaching them one time. I am a reasonably bright and ridiculously overeducated guy, but my wife vacillates between thinking that I'm stupid or that I'm trying to kill her. <laughs> Here's why. I drive an old Ford Ranger pickup truck that is manual everything. Manual door locks, manual transmission, manual windows for you younger teachers. It's a handle on the door. <laughs> that goes like this. My wife has repeatedly told me, and in part because I use this example a lot, I'm actually getting better. But she's repeatedly told me, Randy, when you drive my car at night, which is much newer in automatic everything, automatic transmission, power windows, power doors, automatic lights, that she never touches the switch. I, when I park that car at night, unless I'm thinking, Randy, don't touch the light switch, what is my default behavior? to turn them off. I've driven since I was 15 years old. I'm 65. I've been driving for 50 years. This is a hard behavior for me to learn. You fifth grade teachers need to remember some of the behaviors that you will find annoying were in fact tolerated, perhaps even celebrated, by the teacher that these kids spent a year with last year. They're going to forget. They're going to touch the light switch. I'm not saying you tolerate it. I'm saying also don't get hugely agitated about it. And you middle school and high school teachers, you need to realize that some of the behaviors that annoy you are behaviors that are tolerated, perhaps encouraged and reinforced by the teacher that these kids came from five minutes ago. School's very complicated. We need to teach expectations like a great basketball coach, which means with clarity, with repetition across time, and with inspiration, this is who we are, this is how we do it, this is what we get to do, in order to teach the academic and behavioral skills. We also need to teach the patterns, the, the, what we want from kids, what are the goals and objectives. And I'm just going to share with you a, a little um, video that is the introduction to a program that's just being built. My wife, Marilyn, is lead author, Ann Watanabe is a co-author. It's called Third Quest. They put together this wonderful little orientation video to teach kids within reading you're heading towards automaticity, but to achieve automaticity requires practice and practice requires perseverance. In the third quest, you will work on training your brain to be stronger, faster, and more automatic. You will work for a power called automaticity. Automaticity means being able to do something so well you don't think about it. When a person walks, he or she isn't thinking about moving each leg or balancing. It's just something most people can do. Think about this example. This racer is doing many things with automaticity, balancing, pedaling, steering and turning, braking and stopping, watching where he's going. This beginning bicycle rider is not able to balance, pedal, steer, and watch where he's going all at once. He cannot ride with automaticity. With practice, balancing, pedaling, steering, and braking will all become automatic. The rider will be able to do these things without thinking. With enough practice, he may even win races. Automaticity happens over time as a result of 
initial learning, and then repeated practice. You have developed automaticity in many skills. Your personal timeline can help you think about examples of automaticity in your life. Think about the time before you were five years old. You learned to walk with automaticity, eat with automaticity, and talk with automaticity. Think about the time after you were five years old. You learned to count to 10 with automaticity, run and brush your teeth with automaticity. Automaticity in reading. The goal of reading is to understand what we read. This requires automaticity in identifying letters, remembering the sounds that letters make, sounding out and recognizing words. Just like walking or throwing a ball, with repeated practice, stronger and more automatic reading skills become. Eventually, your mind doesn't need to use as much energy to identify the words. Instead, you can use your mental energy to understand what you are reading. As you develop automaticity in reading, you will level up. It is all doable. You can master reading and take control of your options. So it's about teaching kids skills and strategies that will allow them to learn big picture skills and strategies that will allow them to master the academic skills that will allow them to be successful in life. Okay, I'm going to skip some things because I'm a little bit behind. I want to go to the O of this STOIC acronym. We need to observe student behavior, we need to circulate, we need to scan. You would be better off with one active playground supervisor than three adults who are standing around the playground talking to each other. It requires active, systematic supervision. We'll talk about that some of those of you that are with me in the foundation uh, session. I am in some secondary schools where there's not nearly enough adults in the halls. If you don't have enough in the adults in the halls, I do not care what the socioeconomic status is of the community that you serve. I don't care whether it's poverty, whether it's affluence, or whether it's some mix. You will have rampant bullying. You will have rampant drug deals going down. Some people say, why can't we get children behaving without needing all this supervision? Reread Lord of the Flies. <laughs> and I say that to get a laugh, and thank you for that laugh, but I'm actually dead serious. The whole theme of that book is this. Children need the presence of adults to teach how civilized society operates because it's very, very complicated. And without us being there to guide children towards civilized society, what they will construct on their own is brutal, hideous, power-based stuff wherein a tiny percentage are so powerful they will brutalize another tiny percentage. And I know you're training your kids. We don't do that in this school. We don't tolerate bullying. But the 95% of the kids who are at neither one of those spectrums, if there are not adults present, the level of power that these individuals will be able to assert, it is not probable that you will get the 95% to have the courage to go. We don't treat people that way. But if there's lots of adults to help model those things and to help ameliorate the frequency, because most of your bullies are not going to bully if there's an adult right there. Uh, so. We also need to use data. Uh, I would hypothesize that you have interventions that are thrown out by teachers because they didn't feel like a miracle cure. If you have a kid who is disruptive 30 times a day and you start an intervention that in three weeks, that's down to 28 times a day, you look at that on a chart and you're going, this is fabulous. If this were a medical trial, they'd be going past this sucker, get the FDA right now, this is fabulous. But at 28 disruptions, it's still going to feel so disruptive that if you don't see it on a chart, you will throw out that intervention. So we have to observe, and we have to observe across time. While we are observing, we have to interact positively with kids. We have to build relationships with kids, greetings and other non-contingent interactions, specific, descriptive, positive feedback and ratios of at least three times more attention when kids are not misbehaving than when they are. I am in secondary schools where there's not enough adults in the hall. That's problem A. I am in some schools where there's plenty of adults in the hall, but too many of them, if you will imagine for me, I am standing against the wall and the door to my classroom is here. It always saddens me to see an adult during that five minute passing time looking like this and missing at least 30 opportunities to interact with kids. I'm 
I'm going to give you a definition of school climate. School climate is the daily collective behavior of your staff. And we ought to be as consciously invitational in schools as Disney demands of their employees, which is conscious invitationalness at all times. You do not need to be my personality to do this. If you're more effervescent and bubbly, be more effervescent. If you're more businesslike and laid back, be more laid back. But we all should be doing some variations with our, in our own style of something like this. Good morning, Marco. Yeah, get going on that. Thank you. Nice to see you too. Get going on that challenge problem. Uh, Allison, how are you? Uh, great. See you fifth period. Um, Armand, how are you today? Good. Enjoyed having you in class last year. And you know what adults in high schools and middle schools should also do? They should occasionally walk out into the middle of the hallway. <laughs> because adult presence in the middle of the hallway communicates that we're not afraid of you people. <laughs> we actually are comfortably being right in the middle of you people. Uh, I have grandbabies. I'm going to show you their pictures in just a minute. They're two and they're four. They're just learning social skills. One of the social skills that they're learning is thank you. Those of you who are parents or grandparents, if you hand something to a 14-year-old or 14-month-old and that child doesn't say thank you, we have sort of a standard, I think, in most homes, a standard one-liner correction that most of us say, and on my signal, I want all of us to say it, it does begin with the word what. You hand the child something, the child doesn't say thank you, we do not send the kid to time out. We do not put shackles on the kid. We do not send them to a special center. We say, what do you say when somebody gives you something? I want you to talk at your table. I have no data to support this. But here's my grandbabies. That's Katali. That's uh, Grandma Marilyn. Um, that's Kayaba. That's Mommy and Daddy and Katali in the background, 4th of July. Uncle Matt took these pictures, by the way. Um, over the course of becoming civilized, which requires until the age of 18 or 20, by the way, and I don't mean months, how many times do you think a kid, especially a kid who has the great good fortune to have family and extended family, all of whom value good basic social skills, how many corrections, and don't say a lot to people at your table, I want you to hypothesize a number, and your guess is as good as mine, but over the course of 18 to 20 years of forgetting to say thank you, how many times have they heard, what do you say when somebody gives you something? Just a quick. 60 seconds. What do you think it is? <laughs> if I could have your attention, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I heard that line, by the way. Uh, um, the, the first time I ever used this as an example, I was actually doing a foundation session or something smaller at our national conference a number of years ago, and I just thought I'd try it out. And I tried it out, and I said, what did some of you come up with? And people hollered out 300. Somebody said, oh, not enough. Somebody said 1,000. Somebody said, oh, not enough. Somebody said 4,000. There was one gentleman in the back. He said, I told my children one time. <laughs> And I was a little bit thrown off by it, and I paused because I'm, I'm thinking, how do I diplomatically respond? Because I have no not, belief that that's not true. But there was a woman seated in the front. She looked over her shoulder, and while I paused, she said, your wife did most of the child care, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> and to his credit, he laughed. My, my point is this. My point is this. We're not using harsh corrections, but we're being relentless in our high expectation that this will take place. And it only takes a split second to go, what do you say when somebody gives you something? And over time, it sinks in. Now, I am not saying that every correction is going to be handled by a one-liner. In fact, uh, Dr. Bill Jensen's wonderful work, the Tough Kid material, the chapters on reductive strategies. With more severe misbehavior, we do need more severe correctives. But we need to be in implementation, whether it is a one-liner or whether it is a, a more intensive reductive technique, we need to implement them calmly, consistently, immediately, and respectfully. Now, heading towards wrapping up this theme of best practice and then just a few announcements. In practicing best practice, 
Why do we bother? And again, here's my grandbabies, uh, because they had a caregiver who, for Mother's Day, worked with them to bake cookies for mom, which is teaching them gratitude, teaching them following directions. Teaching, so even the caregiver, grandma and grandpa, aunt, uh, aunts and uncles, caregivers, even those children will have complex lives. Life, nobody has a lake woebegone life. Some people, we're working real hard to give them lake woebegone circumstances, but nobody has a lake woebegone life. Life is tough. And children like these, who have, they're physically healthy, they're neurologically healthy, they've got a soci sociological benefits that uh, would be to dream of for many people, they still need good teachers. But you know who needs really great teachers? It's kids who have any challenges that at least for right now, these children do not have. They need great teachers because we need to try to make up for some of those gaps. And Albert Bandura said this, in order to succeed, people need a sense of self-efficacy to struggle together with resilience to meet the inevitable obstacles and inequities of life. He further said, People who have a sense of self-efficacy bounce back from failure. They approach things in terms of how to handle them rather than worrying about what can go wrong. So my point is, first of all, we need to practice good best practice for kids. We also need to practice best practice for our colleagues because the job in schools is so incredibly difficult. And again, bear with me while I uh, just skip a couple of things here. I want to go to... Uh, this. Calendar reminders about strategies. I hope that what you will be looking for in your sessions across the next four days are things that confirm what you already know, but also things that stretch you further and that you will put those on a calendar to think about them, reread about them, and then implement them. Because here is something I know. Your, your daily role in schools, when I'm in schools, which is not as much as I used to be, but when I'm in schools, I am literally in awe of how hard I see people work. Even in a school that would be maybe not even a strong school, I'm going, these people are working like crazy to try to make this work for these kids. And what is hard is you don't have five days where you can practice and then the two hours of the game on Friday night. You're having to practice best practice while you're trying to hold it together every day. So I hope what you can learn from us are some additional strategies, but that you quite literally, and to the trainers in the room, something I might encourage you to do is, for example, where I'm going to be talking about some school-wide issues of ratios of interactions, I'm going to encourage people in my foundation session to actually put when where on the calendar are you going to put reminders that we need to give our staff reminders about ratios of interactions? They intellectually know it, but did you know that physicians, of course, intellectually know they're supposed to wash their hands, but if a hospital isn't giving them reminders, they wash their hands about 50% of the time that they should? Documented, literally. There's several books written about this. Yikes, yes. Um, if physicians need to be reminded to wash their hands, guess what? Your teachers need to be reminded to pay attention to ratios of interactions. So turn this work into action steps. And in the introduction to the book, uh, which is uh, Practice Perfect by Doug Lamoff, uh, who, who also wrote uh, Teach Like a Champion, both wonderful books, lots of great strategies. In the introduction to that book, Dan He, uh, who's a, a co-author of Made to Stick, said the enemies of practice are pride, fear, and self-satisfaction. To practice requires humility. It forces to submit that we don't know everything. And the three that he laid out there, pride, fear, and self-satisfaction, I had another one that I just previewed for you. The greatest challenge is you have so much that you have to do every day. You literally have to carve out times, and not every day, but you have to carve out times to go, today I'm going to be conscious of working on this particular skill. So. Uh, we all really do have to practice best practice. 30-second uh, wrap-up here. The goal of this conference, to empower you with additional academic and behavioral strategies that will help all students thrive. And the conclusion is this. 
Look for strategies that confirm what you already know and what you do, but you have to work to maintain those because as you're expanding and trying to do more, good strategies can drift away. We hope you will find strategies also that expand your repertoire and that you will practice those to mastery and create operational reminders to yourself of specific times that you will in, in fact practice to both acquire and maintain evidence-based behavioral practices. Thank you so much for the privilege of being here. Thank you.